discussing general equilibrium uh, and we have considered two situations before and after a, an improvement in the transport system, reduced transport costs. Uh, <coughs> and uh, it's a kind of a, what we can call a comparative statics analysis. We compare the situation before the improvement with the sit situation after the improvement. Now I'm going to, to introduce uh, a bit of dynami dynamics into this uh, this uh, situation, but before I do that, <coughs> I will talk a bit about what is actually determining uh, regional output and regional growth, economic growth in a region. Um, as a, as an introduction to to a bit more of uh, of dynamic uh, analysis here. Um, <coughs> so the, the rest of the lecture uh, builds upon uh, a couple of papers which are listed in the, in the lecture plan. And also I have uh, now posted um, part two of the article collection so that you have that uh, in at hand. And I also made some corrections to, to the first lecture notes and the lecture plan um, based on some comments that I got last time. So it should be it should be okay now, with uh, coherence between page numbers here and there. So we are now. We are going to talk a bit about why do we bother with regional policies, where transport systems is a very important part. Is are a very important part. Uh, the background is that uh, some regions. And you can translate that to microsystems or m more macrosystems like uh, continents, uh, more in, in a more global context. But some regions have have, a, have had or and still has a higher high growth rate, while others are lagging behind. And this has puzzled. Uh, regional scientists for uh, for uh, for ages. Uh, the difference has not I the difference in development has not entailed very large differences in living standards in developed economies. There are, um, if you take Europe as an example, differences, but they are not not very high. Um, so, so there is a kind of, there are some mechanisms that are counteracting forces to, to, to sort of uh, reg regional differences. But in developing countries, <coughs> the differences may be quite large between regions within a, a country and, uh, and also between, between countries. So, and this is uh, in the... <laughs> In the in mankind's history, this is a this is a new phenomenon. Because in uh, in ancient times, the living standards were much more equal than they are today. So there has been a development where some regions have gained momentum, power of growth, growth power, as compared to other regions or country. And why why is it so? We can talk. We can. It's always good to have a definition. I'm talking a lot about regions, but what is a region? There are not many clear definitions on that, but we can uh, try to uh, narrow it down a bit. They may have common political institutions. <coughs> so, on a county level, Merin Romsdal, or a national level, Norway or even uh, larger regions than that, the EU, have um, at least to some extent common political institutions. 
common public authorities <coughs> that coordinate different important parts of the of the community sector goes with uh, counties, nations, and also trade unions like the EU has, to a certain extent, common public authorities within these, these areas. And the common currency, which is <coughs> a highly, uh, let's say, there are lots of disputes about the common currency in the, in the, in the EU these days, as you know. Uh, for for uh, for good reasons, I uh, I used to say <coughs> back in the nineties, in the beginning of the nineties, that the common currency was the one step ahead that was too much for the for for Europe at the time, because to have a common currency, you should have uh, a, f a fairly a fair equality with respect to to to, um, to the national economies to to be able to handle a common currency without running into severe problems like we see today but uh, <laughs> there is a certain path dependency here it's very difficult to 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 get rid of a common currency uh, so that's why we we s Europe struggles quite a bit with some, some of the member states. The regional borders are in transition. <coughs> um, there are this, the concept, the regional concept is, uh, is not a static uh, phenomenon. It, uh, regions can be expanded, like we have seen uh, both on the national level in this country where, where uh, larger regions have been established for, uh, for some of of the, the public authorities, uh, as I mentioned here, uh, and the EU cohesion policy has also tried to, to let's say, regionalize to make uh, more of these, uh, these uh, uh, arenas uh, common for the for EU as a region. So then, when we when we have kind of or perhaps agreed a bit upon what we can consider as a region, uh, we can uh, go a step further and look upon the resource base of the regions. What do we have of real resources in a region to play with when we talk about economic development and growth and change? Of course, <coughs> these are given from, uh, from nature, climate, the challenge these days perhaps, geology and topography, fjords and mountains, <coughs> is, uh, islands is, uh, is a totally different story as compared to, uh, let's say, the flat land of uh, northern Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, and partly France, where, much it's, where it's much easier to, to link communities together uh, in, a, in a physical sense. Well-functioning political and social institutions. There is a Swedish economist, which we will, uh, I will cite a bit later on in the course, called Gunnar Myrdal. He wrote a book in, uh, in 1957, which was called the economic theory of underdeveloped regions. He was occupied with uh, the, the rather bad situation for uh, African countries at the time. And he underlined two things, that trade partners, partners who engage in trade should be fairly equal in terms of uh, Let's say that the conditions for trade should be should be fairly uh, equal, so that not one country benefited itself at the expense of another country. So trade, pa the, 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 there should be a balance between trade partners. And the second <coughs> was that countries should have a system for 
what we might call automatic stabilizers in the economy. Have you heard the term automatic stabilizers before? No. I mean, if, if a region loses their cornerstone industry overnight, that a big, uh, a big factory moves away, and, uh, and the region is, lagged, is, is kind of lagging behind because they have lost their uh, sort of their economic engine has, has gone. Then the point of, of having uh, the stabilizers are that the central government can then stimulate the remaining uh, economic players in the region by, by, by uh, giving funds, giving support to, uh, to establish new, new economic activity, to, uh, to uh, establish new firms and so on, for a period of time, to help them through a very difficult period if the main economic in engine moves to China. And that system has, has worked fairly well in many countries. If you don't have that, this region will, uh, will, uh, will uh, lag behind. Uh, poverty, social problems and everything. And under or the characteristics of such regions is that the resources that are there, natural resources, human resources and everything, is, is not used in a productive way. So you need to have a certain amount of wealth to be able to be productive. I mean, if you are hungry all the time, it's easy to understand that, uh, that your, uh, your production capacity is not, at, uh, it's not up to standards. So poverty, as uh, Gunnar Miral says, will <laughs> entail more poverty. So he was, uh, and, and that is why he got the Nobel Prize in economics, because of his work with, with the, let's say, equity policy and social institutions as a, as a means for enhancing productivity. Not just for being kind to people, but for, for, making, for increasing the economic well-being of, of, a, of a region or a, or a nation. And of course, we have natural resources <coughs> as, as the fourth uh, important factor. Maybe minerals, oil, gas, fish, wood, water, and so on. But if you take the resource base, and then let's say the, the natural resources, and try to study the link between the, uh, let's say, the, the, the size of the natural resource base per capita or whatever, and you try to study the link between the, the, the natural resource base and the, and the regional development, economic growth, uh, let's say per year, you don't get much out of that. So natural resources uh, in themselves is not a dominating explanatory factor behind economic growth. Japan is the, <laughs> is the main example of that. They don't have much natural resources, but a very strong record on, on growth. So, uh, <coughs> and then we can look at, uh, at, at capital and capital accumulation. I will come back to that in a bit more in detail. But uh, if you manage to attract capital, you are in a way on the track of something that we might call cumulative or self-perpetuating self development. And if you are able to increase your capital base as one resource, 
you get more wealthy as a region and when you get more wealthy you increase your demand when you increase the demand depending so of course of whether you produce yourself or whether you import everything as, as we shall see a bit, a bit later on you get increased economic activity when you increase your economic activity you may uh, increase your profits you increase your capital base even further and then you are in a loop a positive self-reinforcing chain of events this is a very simple illustration of of a pattern increased capital based increased wealth increased economic activity increased capital base and from that very simple let's say chain here you can start to discuss equity policy what I uh, called or what Miral called social institutions because if <coughs> the capital is in the hands of very few people if the if the demand then as a consequence of that is in the han hand of very few people and all the others are, po are poor I mean it's a limit to how a few people what what uh, demand a few people can cause right they they will when they have consumed what they are able to consume they cannot drive more than one car at a time and so on and so on they will start to put their money into Swiss banks or whatever they will not be in the, the the capital may not be engaged in in productive activity and a lot of people which could have a potential for becoming more wealthy and hence cause increased uh, demand will will not be players in an economy with very large differences so that's why this equity policy is a very it's a very important mechanism for both uh, stability and growth so if you if you read I'm not trying to glorify the let's say the the welfare model that is called the Scandinavian welfare model but there are some increased attention towards that model nowadays from for instance the United States of America because they have been in a situation of with, with, with lagging economic growth very weak economic growth and a very strong difference in wealth between the groups in the population other circumstances that can explain economic growth <coughs> is um, I say we are uh, focusing on transport systems here and uh, transport costs have the largest significance for location of let's say low value hi high volume activities in a traditional that is kind of a slightly traditional view but uh, <coughs> transport costs affects it matters much more to choose the optimal location in terms of transport costs if you have this kind of low value high volume activities where transport costs will be a larger share of the let's say the costs that you are uh, or the price that you are uh, able to charge from the from the end customer so it's a good strategy to locate look like steel plants or gravel pits mining activities close to the natural resources seems fair this sentence this paragraph is a condensed version of the way the former Soviet Union and the United States of America planned their activities related to mining in particular 
to get metal for uh, production of uh, or steel, basically steel, mainly steel to produce cars and uh, railways, locomotives, and uh, everything. The Soviet Union, Rus Russia today, and a lot of other countries, they had a, a very centralized economy based on planning. They had plans, five-year plans, and they wanted to have people living in specific places. So they had the mines in one place, and you had the, the, the industry that was going to extract metals from all the rocks, the, the gravel, or the ore that you got from the minings, from the mines. So they needed to transport a lot of, let's say, what we call in logistics for waste, unproductive movements of uh, rather heavy cargo from the mines and a long distance by rail to the, to the factory where the metal was extracted. Because they just decided that people should live in specific places. Whereas in the US, they left that to the market for better or for worse, but it resulted in a totally different location strategy. They located the extracting industry very close to the mines. So they saved a lot of transport costs in that way. Uh <coughs> For industries where transport costs and the local resource base means less, there is a tendency that I locate close to the end user markets. We'll look a bit closer to the, uh, uh, upon this when we are going to deal with the Weber, Weber location theory. But if the transport cost base means, means less, you will have a very strong integration between the end users and the producers. Where do you find the lawyer firms, the consul big consultancy firms? Uh, you don't find them out in the countryside. You find them in the core of the bigger cities. Close to the end user markets. And we'll talk more about such industries also later on. But even these factors are not enough to explain regional differences. So that's when we, uh, when we turn to cumulative causation. I will talk a lot of th about this different mechanisms behind cumulative causation through throughout this course. Because this is kind of the a, a quite modern way of looking upon uh, reasons for, for economic growth. May I explain the dynamics behind strong regions and the lagging of weaker ones? I've given a few indications. Um, the main focus here is that <coughs> we have economies of scale in production. Economies of scale means that the more you, you, you produce up to a certain capacity limit, the more, uh, the lower will the average cost of producing one good be. So when you have economies of scale, you have a diminishing average cost curve, meaning that if you increase the volume, you reduce the average unit cost. And this is <coughs> this is um, not only about using a production equipment, because you can see the you can easily see the intuition when we talk about manufacturing. Because if you have available capacity in a factory, you can increase the throughput, the production number of units, up to the capacity limit and the cost per unit, because then you have the capital equipment, you have invested a lot in it, it doesn't cost that much to produce one extra unit. 
So the average cost per unit will decrease up to the point when the capacity constraint is starting to take effect. But if you think further about this, think about yourself. You are, you are now in a getting a, a degree, bachelor's, master's. Perhaps some of you will proceed even further than that. But you are, uh, you, are, you are still one human being with your, uh, with, with your uh, resources. And where is the capacity limit for us as individuals? It's not easy to say. But it is fair to say that an increased level of education would contribute to increased uh, productivity from each and every one of us, at least in most cases. There are some exceptions, of course. <laughs> uh, so when we learn more, when the human capital is, uh, is uh, what I'm saying, when we learn more is that the human capital base of a society is increasing. And that can happen in, in, in different ways. And I will also come back to that when we deal with specific types of theories that addresses human capital. But human capital has gained a lot of attention during the last, say, 20 to 30 years in, in, in economic growth theory. Another dimension has to do with size of economic systems, sizes of, uh, of, of specific markets, could cause increased product diversity. I mean, a, a larger, let's say, um, a larger uh, number of variants of a product. And product diversity, if you, if you, con if you continue on, on your master's degree here, you will have a course in, or you may be able, uh, have the option to choose a course in product diversity. And the teacher there will then show you some empirical studies that establishes a link between increased product diversity and demand. Because the market has a preference for having a lot of different products to choose between, of course, up to a certain limit. Product diversity can also make um, production per unit cheaper. Is there any of you fond of chocolate? Do you eat chocolate? Have you seen the strategy of uh, one of the main producers of uh, at least Norwegian chocolate, chocolate recently? Have you noticed what they are doing? They are using a template of milk chocolate. And uh, when I grew up, they sold it as milk ch chocolates. End of story. Milk chocolate, one type. But now they are, they are adding components from other types of chocolate that they have produced for a long time. So now you get milk chocolate, but you get it with a lot of variants. And the, uh, and the number is increasing. So I would very much like to see that if any, <laughs> any of you proceeds with a master thesis, I would like to see a good study of, let's say, profit, profitability of this producer in a time series study when you also take into consideration the increased product variety that I have introduced. But you cannot do that without having a, a larger and growing market. That is why you have economies of scale in that dimension as well. 
so uh, <coughs> there is, and there, the, it's quite some research going on trying to find the link between the size of economic activity, the size of the economic system, and productivity. I will, I will uh, come back to this, not in the next lecture, but actually today, in the next session. I will come back to the Fedorn law of increased productivity with increased size of the economic system. And the increased productivity is simply reduced factor prices because of scale effects. That is the main driver in this. It's not, not more mysterious than that. So when you increase the activity, you reduce unit prices. And when you do that, <coughs> indirectly, you in, in, increase the competitive power of this industry or the region. So <coughs> I can apply this from the Bible, the Matthias principle. Those who have shall be given, and those who have nothing, everything should be taken away. Okay? So when the barriers to trade is reduced, and if you don't have the balance between regions, if you don't have the stabilizers in place, well developed regions will easily become winners at the expense of weaker regions. It's a story about the trade between uh, Africa and, uh, <coughs> and Europe some uh, hundred years back. And I'm afraid that this history can repeat itself, but not perhaps with Europe, but with China as, as the, main, uh, the main wealthy part in this, uh, this trade dyad between a poor country and a rich, rich and uh, wealthy country. So what we can just illustrate this scale principle. Some of you have seen this before. This is uh, cost. prices and the cost this means average cost is investment costs plus variable cost per unit production cost per unit divided by divide by x. So <coughs> if uh, this is the situation at the outset, This horizontal line is the variable costs of the unit costs of production in a very, in a, let's say, in the short run when you have available production capacity. Now we are at the factory level. The unit costs are constant, but you have made a big investment to purchase machinery, to raise buildings and also to raise competence among the staff or the employers uh, that are going to work with this production. So up to a certain limit. This, we can, we can consider the production cost as constant per unit, but at a certain point in time, we will have a increase 
in unit costs when the capacity constraint is, is approached. And then also the average costs will then start to increase in the same way. So in the longer run, the average costs may increase again. But as long as we have excess capacity, we are in a situation where increased volume and increased volume will be the output if we increase the size of the demand. We get a reduced price and increased volume. So if you think back to this situation where uh, the demand for exports it has increased because you have reduced the transport costs. It's easier to go to somewhere else to, to purchase your, your uh, items, whatever it is. The demand for the items on the other side of this uh, transport link, the demand for the items increases. And we can think of a situation where then the average cost of bringing those items to the market is reduced. And if I assume here that there is a, is a, cert there is a fair amount of competition between shops or factories, so that I cannot ch charge more than the average costs. Then we will have this, this, uh, this profile, where increased volume, scale, reduced prices, increased volume. Increased volume. And I cannot illustrate that in this figure, but uh, then you can we can talk about increased product variety, larger market, perhaps newcomers comes in into this market because they see this this large growth, uh, competitive pressure, and uh, everything which can reinforce this movement further on into the into the future. We'll come back to this later on. But the scale, just to understand the effect of increased scale, is, is important uh, in this discussion. I have just put in a, <coughs> in a, in a reading advice here. You should just pay attention to that. Parts of chapter six are uh, have some advanced discussions, which I don't demand you to 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 remember because it's uh, it's partly irrelevant for this uh, this course. These are again a kind of a stabili stabilizer because even if you may have differences in uh, in uh, economic activity level in productivity between regions, there is a certain rigidity with respect to wages. And you might ask why should that be the case that you, you are having a, a more rigid wage system? And to a certain extent, wages should not be rigid. But on the other hand, to have two large differences Again, if you think back to this, uh, this uh, discussion about distribution of wealth and the uh, demand effects, if more people are wealthy, the demand for uh, goods and services may increase more than if you have the wealth concentrated on, on the very few hands, where my, perhaps a larger fraction is, is just put up for savings. That is one underlying 
observation that supports a certain rigidity in the, in the, in the, in the, in the wages. Increased productivity <coughs> could also entail reduced wage costs per produced unit. And uh, we are uh, actually discussing this mechanism in the last, last point here. Increased productivity in terms of uh, unit uh, cost per unit could uh, also attract more demand because it is observed in the market that uh, there is a something going on in that region. I mean, you can go there and get get a pair of uh, new skis or whatever for uh, half the price. And the reason why they can offer that is that uh, there is an expectation that the demand will follow. Then you have the negative <coughs> external effects. which is, let's say, a counteracting force to this. Because if you have a situation where you have improved the transport system, people are using uh, more transport services, you may end up in a situation where the capacity of the transport network or the urban network at large Becomes comes under pressure. So the shorthand version of negative externalities is that the demand will enter into a situation where somewhere in the in the system bottlenecks will occur, costs will increase, and uh, let's say the growth comes to a halt because you don't, you don't get scale effects anymore. And the problem with external effects are that the costs of these adverse effects are not internalized in the production costs or the costs of using the transport network. I might come back to that. Cumulative causation, <coughs> this self-reinforcing effects, productivity effects, self-reinforced effects from increased capital accumulation, may explain national differences better than regional differences because of the rigidities that I, uh, I was talking about. Taxation systems, and the wage system. You may have the stabilizers, equity policies, and so on, established on the national level. But those policies may differ between countries. That's why national differences are, uh, are uh, stronger than differences between or within countries. If we then talk about countries that have such stabilizers it's established. The crisis, I guess you have heard about the big financial crisis in 1929, when more or less the whole industry, manufacturing industry in the United States went bankrupt, and, where th and that spread on to, to Europe and uh, caused, caused a lot of uh, of, of bad situations for people. That took place because of the lack of such stabilizers. Today, when the, econ uh, when the economy goes into a downturn, public sector bor borrows money and induces activity to sort of buffer off the reduction in activity in the private sector. That did not happen in 1929. And then the whole thing went, it was a landslide of, of bankruptcies and so on. After 2008, the 2008 crisis, you saw the, the behavior is quite different. European countries and even the United States borrowed a lot of money and induced activity 
to 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 buffer off the the decline in uh, in uh, in the private sector economy to to boost activity try to keep up uh, the the wealth of the of the um, consumers because if every, if everything contracts uh, in the sense that people demand significantly less than they used to the the whole economy can can actually stop and you get this effect instead where the demand is uh, going in this way and you see what happens very large very high sharp increase in prices and a, a significant reduction in demand and this can also be a, a self-reinforcing effect that can actually bring the whole thing to to a complete lock halt the activity is significantly reduced and then the noble art of uh, dimensioning these automatic stabilizers is of course uh, a job for a qualified economist to take care of. One more slide and then I'll break. Uh, so that's also in this paper by Nicholas Calder called The Case for Regional Policies. He discusses these automatic stabilizing measures. Which is, uh, which is actually an important factor when we talk about stimulating growth and also to avoid uh, sharp decreases in activity. So the discussion of cumulative causation and regions is, a c is, is what Calder is doing in his paper and uh, we'll try to to develop this into uh, a model in the next section. So then we break again. And the hard part comes now. Last hour. Okay. So we start again at a bit um, 17 past or something. <laughs>